So what we're going to go over is some of the things that I have put together working on my horses the last 10 years. I guess one of the things I feel like that has gone well for me is keeping myself out of trouble because I work on a lot of really nasty feet. And supposedly coming in being the smart guy to fix the horse, it looks really bad when I do something and they're worse in a few days and I have to go back. So I've put a lot of time and effort into that. I like sunrises and sunsets. That brings up an interesting point. How do you know whether that's a sunrise or sunset? It's pretty hard unless you ask a couple questions and figure it out. Feed it the same way. Don't just take something at face value. Ask some questions, get more information, and you'll find out something maybe totally different than what you think. All right, so I call this the ultimate crap show. Uh, I've been around a couple of these. This was a horse that I was at the clinic doing some work, and they asked me to pull the shoes for an MRI. And what a mess. So this isn't going to show up very well. The top red line is the interface between the foot and the shoe. The bottom red line is the most distal portion of the frog that has prolapsed through the shoe. That's the rubber part of that shoe is about half an inch thick, so that's about how much prolapse we have in it. And you can look above and see what all is happening to this foot. This is obviously a mess. I don't know how long overdue this horse is. I don't know if there was some support material in there at some point or not, but all I know is this is a mess now. So some of you are probably thinking, well, gee whiz, Dr. Baird, I'd never do that to a horse's foot. And I believe you, and that's good. However, we do this on a fairly regular basis. We just don't know it. I've done it, you guys do it, because it's subtle. Or we know what's going on in owner compliance. We can't do anything more. So if we go to the next slide, here's a big horse, 1,400-pound warm blood. His foot's trimmed. He's eagerly awaiting the application of his newly forged shoe. So we do that, and then within about 20 minutes, we take a radiograph. So you guys can see what's happening here. Our PAs drop from whatever that is, three or four or five degrees, to flat. And if you look close, I've got a barium marker there and there. So we have a little bit of a prolapsed frog that's giving us some wedge, but nothing like this. So this foot, as soon as that frog is unloaded, descends through the shoe. And this horse hasn't gone anywhere, done anything. This is just standing there on the blocks 20 minutes later. This horse needs some help. We'll come back to this. Okay, so the main things I run into, and I hate to sound cliche, but there's just too much foot in the front half, meaning the toes are too long. We hear that over and over and over, and I'm going to explain, I think, a little bit of something that I hope, hopefully helps, or we simply have an imbalance around the center of articulation of the coffin joint. Second thing I see, especially living in Florida, I don't know how many of you guys have been there, but it's wet, it's humid, and it's a nightmare on some of these horses trying to keep soul depth underneath them. So I see a lot of that. And so then we have a support problem. Either we haven't had enough, and that's allowed the horse to come to thin soles, or we have too much, and now they're sore over the thin soles. And then I deal with negative PAs, frog pathology, wedging without support. We'll talk about that just a little bit. I don't know what order those are in as far as importance, but there we go. Okay, digital toe length. Anybody ever heard that term? Okay, that's because I made it up. That's kind of become fashionable recently. It's just make up a term dealing with the horse's foot. So I'm going to jump on the bandwagon and there we go. So digital toe length is simply the amount of foot you have cranial to the tip of the coffin bone. That's it, regardless of where your mechanics are break over, and we'll define that in these terms. Wherever that is, it, it doesn't matter. So why is this, why is this important? Because we've all had the horse that we've trimmed everything we can from the bottom, set the foot down, you're like, that thing is, that toe is still long. Or the veterinarian's busting your chops, or the owner's busting your chops. Almost always, this is the problem. This distance, you have too much foot ahead of the tip of the coffin bone. And I don't have anything scientific to back this up, but after looking at horses and radiographs for a while, it seems like 30 millimeters is kind of the magic number where the feet, to me, still look and feel balanced. So what does this mean? For me, it's a guide where I'm going to put my shoe. If I trim up the foot and it still looks long, I double check from the bottom, I can't take anything more, or one of these Florida horses, you didn't take anything to begin with because it's flat, there's no sole depth, but it's still long, and I take a radiograph, 
And that number's like here, that number's 38 or it's 45. That tells me I'm going to back up my shoe to get to that more, what I think is a, an appropriate number of 30. I still will, if I want to have my mechanics rocker in the shoe, I'm going to do that. But that just gives me an idea where and how to back up the shoe. And that number is important for me because I like fit in the toe. I think the horse's the foot needs the toe. I went through the phase of shoeing big and bold and backing everything up, and it just didn't work for me. My feet fell apart, so I did it more, and they fell apart more. And thanks to the light from Craig Turnkey, he got me looking at things a little bit the other way. And so now, even though I might have a lot of breakover in my shoe, I still like to fit the toe. So digital breakover, and I'm sorry for the semantical terms, but I'm just. I'm using these to try and help explain my thinking. It took me a while to wrap my mind around how to explain this and how to define it. So digital breakover, I'm going to define breakover for this discussion because everybody has a different idea what it means. But for us today, it's the most cranial portion of the foot or the shoe that's in contact with the ground when standing on a firm surface, meaning like an x-ray block or concrete or whatever. So nothing more than that. So on this shoe, that's where our breakover starts. So if, if you have a rocker clear back to the tip of the toe, or clear back to the tip of the coffin bone, your digital breakover is zero. If it's clear out to the edge of the foot, flat shot, then your digital breakover and your digital toe length are the same. And I'll go over that just a bit more if that doesn't make sense. So balance around the center of articulation of the coffin joint. That's kind of become another really popular way as part of hoof mapping. But for me, this is really important. It's determined simply by two things. The amount of shoe you have caught to this line and the amount of shoe you have cranial to this line. And for me, the horses I work on, I try to still have that ratio be within 50-50 at the end of the shoe and cycle. I don't want a bunch more toe in the front half than I do the back half. So let's look at this foot. I don't know if you all can see these numbers. This number is 68 millimeters. And this is, if this horse were flat shot, this number is 102. So we have a huge mismatch, way too much foot in the front half. However, with this rocker toe applied just ahead of the tip of the coffin bone, that number is 68. And interestingly enough, this was a horse that my brother and I did a study and presented quite a few years ago here. Um, and we, we shot feet according and applied mechanics according to what the foot was telling us. We didn't do this radiograph guided, but then we went back in and used the radiographs to kind of show what we were looking at. And so that's what we did on this horse, just went off the bottom of the foot. Where does it look like this thing wants a rocker? And it's interesting because that's right where we landed. So I'm pretty happy with that on this foot. There's, some other things in this radiograph I don't like quite as well. So if you don't have radiographs, there's a couple ways to find this center of articulation. And one is it's simply the widest point of the foot, the arch. Um, probably theoretically it's duck, it's bridge, so three quarters to an inch caudal to the tip of the coffin, tip of the frog. That'll land in this spot. And then Grant Moon showed something really cool at a clinic a couple years ago. If you take your thumb, put it at the the coronary band at the toe, just tuck it right behind the coronary band parallel. The back side of your thumb will be the center of articulation. And that'll land you pretty true. So somebody might look at this and say, well, that center of articulation actually needs to be a little bit further back. I won't argue that, whatever. But I guess as far as I'm concerned, we're shoeing horses here, not building space shuttles. So I'm not concerned about two or three or five millimeters. I'm concerned about a horse like this that we're off by 20 or 30. Same slide, I just added the extra two lines. This is our digital breakover, or digital toe length, and this is our digital breakover. Again, if this were flat shot, your digital breakover and your digital toe length would be the same. I hope that makes sense. This has really helped me understand why, the, why and how the toe is too long and what we need to go about to do it. Here's another little bit different scenario. Caudal half, 57 millimeters, cranial half, 75. Now if I look at our digital toe length, it's 26, and I measured that basically to the base of the clip. So you could probably extend this clear out a couple more millimeters, and that puts you at 30. So even though 
this center of articulation balance is crazy out of whack. I don't define this horse as having a long toe. Now, if you look at our barium line, we do have some distortion here. So you may want to address that. I would want to address that. This is not my shoe, I'm just another horse. But my point is, I don't feel like this horse needs his toe back that crazy. What I would like to do is put a rocker or bring the mechanics back to where this cranial number of 75 drops down closer to the caudal number of 57. So we did the Grand Moon thing, drew a line where we thought it was. We didn't do this radiograph guide, just where we thought it was. There's our line, cool, boom. That worked really well, thanks Grant. And then, same picture, we followed this line around to the bottom part of the foot, and there it is. So for me, I was kind of blown away by how far back in the foot that center of articulation is looking at it from the bottom. And somebody might say, oh, I don't think that's right. There's our third nail, there's our line. Our third, you can't see it on this slide. There's our third nail, nail, and there's the line. So that's real. I just found that kind of fascinating. Soul depth, already mentioned this already, big problem. You can measure it wherever you want on the foot. I have one horse in, in here that will measure it at the heel because it's kind of an important number. Eight to 18 millimeters. Um, <clears throat> I don't necessarily get hung up on numbers. I just, I like to see uh, enough mass. And you don't need a, a radiograph typically to pick up a foot and say, we've got enough soul depth or no, we don't. What I can say is, Pretty much any of the horses I work on in Florida, because not only are the soles thin, they're soft, so everything's moving. And they don't, a, a hard, dry, sole, thin sole in Colorado has a lot more resiliency than wet, sloppy, thin sole in Florida. So I can say if the horses drop down below 10 or 12 millimeters, they're usually not happy. And those are the horses you put your hoof testers on and the soles bouncing everywhere. Palmer Angle, talk a lot about this now as well. I'm not going to go into it in great detail. The exact numbers, again, don't mean a whole lot to me. Some horses, if I can keep them out of the negative zone, they end up zero. I'm cool with that. There's club-footed horses with 10 or 12 degree PAs that are sound as can be and pounded down the asphalt. I've worked on some Dutch harness horses with real upright, steep feet. You can't even make them land if you wanted to. But like I said, I, I don't want to see them negative at the end of the cycle. And here's something else that I think is fascinating. I don't have time to go into it. To this but look at where the wing of your coffin bone ends some of them end clear up underneath the navicular bone and some extend further back and we all know that this is all soft tissue that has to support itself but the shorter that wing is on a lot of these feet the more you're going to struggle with the back half of the foot because there's just more soft tissue real estate back there that has to has to support itself if you don't get the bony involvement. So something to keep in mind, especially in a young horse, if you're already starting to struggle, you've just got a little nubby wing of the coffin bone, you probably ought to think about getting some support on that horse through his career. So when does a foot need axial support? In my opinion, can I use the word natural here? Is that okay? I think horses are supposed to share load bearing between the wall, the sole, and the frog. And so when we put a shoe on, that instantly changes that. We've got a compromise to the foot right off. Fortunately, most of the horses tolerate it, deal with it. Some of them, a lot of horses feel way better with the shoe on. So I'm not anti-shoe, don't get me wrong. That's, that's not at all where I'm headed. So instantly, like I say, we've got a compromise to the foot. <clears throat> so any, any pathology, I think, that we're addressing on the foot can use support. I had a big long list you know, all the things that we might be addressing, and then I just erased it. So if you're trying to help the foot, I can make an argument for how they might need some, want some support. Anything that's destabilized the foot, whether it's an injury or keratoma surgery, support them. Feet that aren't growing, if you have a foot that's shut off, nothing's happening, throw some support and mechanics at them, and a lot of those feet will come alive. I've seen a lot of that horse's flat shot backed up, where for five weeks I'm scrounging around, the feet are run forward, I don't have anything to trim or rocker. So I either work with a wedge pad and try and grind some of it out and, and get my mechanics or stick an equilibrium on there and back it up a little bit and support them. Come back, it's amazing how many times I've come back and I have a little bit more foot the next time and the next time we have even more. And some of them turn into a problem now they're growing too much and instead of being able to shoot them in five weeks, we're down to four. I suppose that's a good problem to have. Wedging feet. 
Okay, so if you wedge the horse that we showed when we ready graphed and he stomped a little bit, PA dropped. If you wedge that foot, you're aggravating that even more because you're already overloading the heels and now you've taken the foot further away from the ground. You're losing more of the support. So I, for me, that's a huge no-no. And then I used to say, well, if you, what if you have this uh, navicular quarter horse, little upright foot that is in no way, shape whatsoever, trying to come down through the foot. When he loads it, his PA is not, you can wedge him up 80 degrees and his PA is not going to drop. Can we get away with that? Well, yeah, sure. But let's think about that a little bit more. So if he's navicular and he's doing his little toey first landing thing, the heels at some point have got to load. And when they quit loading, it will be a combination of two things. One is the foot has settled into the footing enough that you've got contact between the frog and sole and your, your whatever your footing is. That stops it and the soft tissue, supportive soft tissue in the limb. So if he's sinking, pretend my, my toe, my heel's going into the footing. If he's sinking and he's navicular, now we're starting to tighten our deflexor and he doesn't like that. So either he's going to hit the bottom with the footing or his, he's going to pull the foot up, which is why we get the short, choppy stride on these navicular horses. So we've wedged this guy up with no support, and this heel starts to sink. Well, he's going to sink right on through the wedge of that shoe, and he's got a way longer distance now for that frog and sole to contact the ground. So if you put something on the ground surface, whether it's equitane, heel plate, whatever, He's not going to drop his heels in the ground near as far with that support than with the open wedge. If he's working on concrete, I don't think it matters. So that's something I've changed in my thinking, and hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Um, Florida, again, wet, crappy feet. They need, they need support. Sorry. And then footing dependent. I won't get into that. So here's this slide again. Same horse, same deal. So what I did was, this was uh, like a year and a half later. The horse wasn't doing a lot. It was in the summertime. He's turned out in the pasture 24-7. So kind of a big rough foot, big horse, you know, hard to manage when he's out 24-7 and all the moisture. So that's his PA at the end of the shimmering cycle. And I finally got the owner's permission to put something on him to help him out. So I stuck on what for me is probably the most conservative form of support that I can use. And that's a leather pad. This one happens to be a wedge pad and some dental impression material. The only less support you could give is if you stuck the pad on there, but you didn't have any impression material. So I think this is really cool. We went from not being able to run our projector. So we went from this negative angle to, if you look close, it's still slightly negative, but nothing, nothing, nothing like we have. And that's measuring, this is another key thing when you're looking at PAs and trying to assess whether what you're doing is working or not. I measure to the, the appliance, to the wedge pad. So we're a little bit negative there. But if we ignore that line and measure to either the ground surface or the flat portion of the shoe, we're sitting at a zero PA. So for me, this is better than nothing on this horse. I'd like to see more, you know, he needs a more rigid support, which I'll show you here in a second. But that helped that horse a lot, in my opinion. Okay, thin soles. This is not a talk about laminitis, thankfully enough, or venograms. But I thought I'd throw this out there for you guys to see. This is a horse that actually worked on a few weeks ago that went on to sink and is no longer with us. But if you don't know what a venogram is, we put a tourniquet around the fetlock, inject a dye into the digital vein, inject a bunch of solution, start taking radiographs, and it shows you our perfusion. And Rick Redden has been phenomenal at to getting this going and acknowledging, we can all acknowledge how helpful this is, or hopefully we can acknowledge. So anyway, that's our perfusion with this horse loaded, standing on the block, both feet are blocked, so he's standing fairly symmetrical. Now we unload this foot. See the difference in perfusion? All of this compared to this? Doesn't change much here in the heel area, but we have a lot more more perfusion. So that just gives us an idea of what happens loaded versus unloaded. And you guys are probably not going to be able to see this. Can you see these little striations? There's, I can see them because I know they're there, but 
There's your line. So those are the papillae. And this thing is flipped up. It should be down here underneath the tip of the coffin. But, but those are your solar papillae that feed the soul growth distal to the tip of the coffin. Bro. So this horse has pretty thin soles. That's part of his problem. Another big warm blood. He's only, he only has 10 or 11 millimeters of soul depth. And I measured this, that papilla, the blood supply is two millimeters thick. The more soul depth you have, the thicker those, the longer those papilla are. So as you can visualize, they get longer, thicker, heavier, your blood supply continually increases, so it's a good positive cycle. So if you take this horse with a 10 millimeter soul depth and these little two millimeter papillae, and you put an equithane pour, clear the ground throughout his whole foot, and let's say you move this foot, move the sole with your fingers, how much do you think it takes to compress those little two millimeter papillae down to nothing? I don't think it takes anything. And I cannot remember the last time I put support underneath the tip of the coffin bone on a laminitis horse. And that is exactly why. And I'm trying to do a little study to, to kind of document this a little bit better. But, but for me, this is a huge deal. You can support that horse, just give it a little bit of room to move, or maybe just support the back half. And then if we look at the solar margin view, does anybody think venograms are cool? Am I just a foot nerd? Okay. Probably. So here's our coffin bone. And then this is the, circum, the circumflex vessels. So now you, you should be able to see these. These are also papillae. And they're sticking out perpendicular to the coffin bone. So this is all part of your soul wall junction. These guys are providing nutrients to where the soul and the wall and the laminae all tie together. Why is that? And it goes clear back. You can't visualize it in the caudal part of the foot near as well as you can in the, the cranial part, but the same principles apply all the way through the foot. So if we go to this horse, think about this. Left slide, horse is standing there, what I'm assuming is kind of a decent equilibrium for all of those vessels. And then we pull his frog support away and that foot starts to descend. Think about those papillae that are sticking straight out, as well as the laminar vessels all the way up the wall, now that is stretched. <clears throat> Your perfusion is not going to be what it's supposed to going around that circumflex artery in the back and, and vein in the back part of the foot. So why is that important? That's why we have a hard time getting over the hump on a lot of these horses, especially if you just, if you put an equithane pack in there and you compress those solar vessels in the caudal half of the foot, they may not get a chance to re recover well enough to really get to grow them. Switch it over and I'll show a shoe here that, that's a great scenario for that if you can do it. Unload those vessels or completely flip that part of the foot. Now those vessels have a chance to come alive. And once you start to break that cycle of compression and stretching, you should be able to start to build a better foot in the back half. Hoof testers, not only from a diagnostic perspective, but for me they're crucial to determine what's sore, what's not, where can I load, blah, blah. Don't start where you think they're sore. If you pick up a foot and you're like, I bet he's sore on this medium heel, and you give him a good pop with the hoof testers and he rips his foot away, he might lie to you the rest of the hoof tester exam, and you're not really sure what's real, what's not, where you can support. You know, some of these chicken-hearted thoroughbreds are terrible trying to figure that out anyway. Take-home message. If you don't learn anything from me this morning, or if you only learn one thing, this is it. If it's thin or it's sore, think twice and three times about if you're going to load that and how you're going to load it. That is what has kept me out of trouble over all the years. Develop a systematic approach with your hoof testers just so it kind of becomes second nature. And then things, you'll notice things without actually thinking about it. Anytime you're shooting a horse with support, Every time you do it, run the hoof testers over it. Find out if this area that was sore is better, this area that wasn't sore is now sore. That will also keep you out of trouble. Frog assessment. Frogs will tell you a lot about what's going on in a foot, for sure. And I'm not even going to get into directional and shape. But a weak recessed foot, excuse me, a weak recessed frog in a low heeled foot kind of freaks me out because I think now that that's a, a digital cushion that just is almost shot. And they're, they're way more challenging to help. 
And so that, that frog at this point is not a viable loading option. You can't expect to stick a hard bar over that, slap some dental on pressure material and get that to come back around. In my world, that just won't happen. So we've got to get a little bit more creative. The opposite is also true. If you've got a big bulbous prolapsed frog, I haven't done it, but I was around a couple other farriers that did, and they thought we're going to shove this back in the same plane, stuck a hard bar on there, nailed it up, and talk about a ticked off horse and a ticked off owner. Though that didn't work well. You can do it, you just have to work with your plate placement, your pad heights, and you may want to do it in phases. And there may, there's probably different ways, better ways to go about it than initially starting off with the hard bar. And I'll show you one of those. And here's something to think about, and this is where getting into more of the vet work and away from just bending over for a living is really helping me. If you have a horse that's really sore on the frog with hoof testers, I now think that this horse might have sore coffin joints. Whether that's the first time you work on them, so obviously you're thinking about how you're going to load this frog or not load it, or when you come back, it was good, but now it's sore, and maybe the owner's complaining a little bit, the horse is maybe a little more stumbly or not moving forward since you put this package on might not be the shoes. It might be the fact that the horse's coffin joints are sore and the support is aggravating that. So if that comes up, I would suggest, the veterinarians might hate you for it, or if they get inject coffin joints, they might like it, but have the vet come out and take a look at that. Because if their coffin joints are sore, I guarantee you they're not moving right. And if they're not moving right, that makes your job of trying to rebuild the feet even more difficult. So get the coffin joints injected. I've got cool stories on coffin joint injections and what it's done to the rest of the body and change foot conformation. Don't have time to get into all that. So that's a biggie for me. Greatly affected by moisture. It's a constant battle here, urban Florida, blah, blah. And respect the changes in your quality and your soreness in your frog and foot. Don't be afraid to change your approach. Whether you need to go a little bit more conservative or if you like what happened, okay, I'm gonna step it up and give this guy a little bit more support. Are you guys lonely? Let me come over to this side. All right, so we know where the horse is sore, getting an idea of what we can load, what we can't load. Cool. Question is, how much support can we get without it turning into pressure? That's the kicker. And how do we want it to interact with the ground? Do you want ground force reaction, like the upper left shoe? That's going to allow the heels to float, the toe to sink, so we get some wedge out of it. I guess you will. That's a big deal. A whole other topic, too. Um, and then traction, right? How are all these going to, especially now that we're dealing with synthetic footing, when you add something that goes clear to the ground, that's definitely going to change how that foot interacts with the ground. And do we need to leave access to somewhere? Uh, I've seen horses that need support, the fairies said, well, the frog was thrushy, so I couldn't put anything on there. Well, get creative. Put a pad on there and cut it out to where you can access the thrush and pour around it. The upper right slide, that horse didn't have thrush, he just had a sucking frog. Um, and he needed support, but didn't like anything on his frog, so we feed it out, support it around it. There's dental impression material under there. Home run for that guy. Um, the upper left was, that's a long story. Owner wouldn't let me nail on anything, so okay, I'll make a little money going on shoes and learn some cool stuff. Um, that's a hinge shoe. We ripped the plate down the center, and then his frogs were sore, so I put the softest impression material under there that I had, and it worked great. However, that foot, interestingly enough, started to distort. The whole thing just started to open up, and I got separation all the way around. And the reason I went to that is because I had him directly with an aluminum shoe, and of course, it doesn't take long, your heels start to shut down. So went too far the other way, so now we get to pick another expensive glue-on shoe. Um, the lower right shoe, horse with tendon injury, stall rest, blah, blah. But the point I want to make here is kind of a cool little trick. If you have all this length sticking out here for support, and it works the same for anybody that's doing derotation shoeings for tenotomies, it's front foot, and you're worried about it ripping that off, take a big ball of dental impression material and form it up to the end of the plate, taper it up to the foot, and you usually have to tape that on, but that'll really help keep them from stepping that off. The lower left shoe I will go over in just a second. The other thing is weight. We weld in this heel plate, if you do that on a hunter horse on a steel shoe, you'll probably get in trouble with the trainer. Um, so keep that in mind. Okay, so the difference in modalities and support. Right. So I call this a rigid grip ground interaction shoe. So these are gonna be straight bars, um, hard bars, heel plates, hospital plates even. I use a lot of hospital plates even on some of my horses that are doing things. 
not for a hospital play, but just to change the mechanics. And so this obviously has a, a, an effect on the ground force reaction. Again, the heels flow, the toe sinks. Um, the, the cool thing about the heel, the heel play or a hard bar or whatever, the support does not change with the footing. They get the same amount of foot between that plate and the foot on concrete as they do soft footing. If they're on a trail ride, they step on a rock. It's all the same. So that's what I like about it. If you have a sore frog and you're getting creative what to do underneath the plate, that frog's going to get the same loading regardless of your footing. And that will keep you out of trouble on a lot of them. So the next one is a flexible ground interaction. And that for me is the Equithane frog support pads. I don't know how many of you guys have ever bubbled a leather pad to come up home with, especially if you have a prolapse frog, or you're just wanting to bring it up and have more, if the frog is sore, have more room for some soft support material between the frog and the pad. Those work really well for that. A little tricky to figure out how to make it work the first couple times. But again, this pressure changes, support changes with the footing, especially, okay, so, as this horse loads, if he loads the back part of his foot, he's going to be pushing that material down through the shoe somewhat. And if he's in a soft footing, the footing is also going to be pushing back up against him. So that may or may not be a good thing, just something you have to, you have to sort out. If it's on concrete, really hard ground, it depends on how much that foot is moving, whether you're going to get a lot of support from that equithane or not. Generally, I feel like equithane is almost more effective on soft ground than hard ground, but that's just my thoughts. Hopefully that makes sense. And that equithane, again, synthetic footing, that may provide a big heavy sticker in the back part of that foot. Of course, they already can't slide on that stuff, so he'll slide even less with that. Um, this horse, another train wreck, laminitis case, is completely out of foot. And it's the kind of thing I sent a picture to my brother. He's like, just put it to sleep. Not that my brother's in inhumane or discompassionate, but you're not going to fix that. But anyway, I'm trying to figure out something to keep going. She's really frog sore, has a thin spot on her bar there. So what that is is a little piece of felt that I glued to the foot, just stuck some wax on it, stuck to the foot, and poured over it. That's a really cool trick. And the final one is minimal ground interaction. So that's something that basically doesn't go back past the I guess the foot surface of the shoe, if you will. So a pad like that, spider plates, you can weld your, your heel plates down in the foot, take it further away from the ground, um, which is also a cool trick, a little off topic, but if you have a horse with a suspensory injury and you're wanting to put a suspensory shoe on and you're broadening the toe, but you're concerned about the back half of the foot, that's a trick you can use. Put your, your toe cap, as I call it, weld it in, and then weld in a heel plate and recess it down as low as you can so when that horse is standing there you get a little lift at the toe and that plate is down in the foot far enough that hopefully it'll allow it to sink but you're still supporting the foot that's worked well on some horses for me and these typically only interact with the ground when you have footing deep enough for it to contact which again may or may not be a good thing and these will, this will have the least amount of effect on traction of the three modalities i showed now, this pad, I didn't invent this, I call them white trash hard bars. The one downside of this is this is going to flex if you don't have it stuck to the foot with Equipack. So some of these horses are going to get sand or debris worked up between the pad and the foot or the impression material, and that can cause a problem. So keep that in mind. But I like that for if you just need to help the horse a little bit on a low budget, that sort of thing. So what support materials are we using? Dental impression material, I use a ton of it. Every company has different degrees of durometer or firmness, if you will. You have to have something to hold it in, whether it's a pad or a plate, or even a, if a horse is on stall rest, you can use a mesh pad and work it through there, and a lot of times that'll stay in place. It doesn't stick to the foot, so therefore it doesn't seal, which is a kicker for preventing abscesses. Kind of an important note. Therefore, it's easy to medicate the foot surface. Fight moisture, put wax or grim's hand or copper sulfate or whatever you want on there. So there's kind of there's different ways to do dental press material. One is put the amount in there you want, nail your shoe up, give the horse his foot, he squirts it out. So he's loading it. It's a pretty conservative way to do it. He's loading it however he wants. Now if you want to 
use impression material but have a little bit more firm, firm support. What you can do is grease your foot with something, a wax or salt pack or something. So as the impression material is setting up, it doesn't stick to the foot. Put it on there. Put your shoe down just manually. Push it down as much as you can. And if you wait till your impression material starts to set up just a little bit, it helps. And then pull it off. And hopefully it's, it should stick to the leather pad, not to the foot, and not distort. If it does distort, give it just a little bit more time, put it back on there and start over. So then you set it aside and let it set up. And if you have areas you want to cut out, now it's really easy to take your knife, pop out that section of dental impression material, and now you have a little bit more, I hate to call it positive pressure, but definitely more support for that foot with your dental impression material. Equithane, everybody knows what that is. It sticks to the foot and seals. I have no idea how many abscesses I've dug out in the bars and seed of the corn from horses that have really thin, when you get that shallowly, scalpy looking area in the bars, and you put equithane over that, that's a great recipe for abscesses, and I've dug out a ton of them. So the fact that it sticks and it seals sets up for bacterial growth. Just keep that in mind. If you're worried about that, do what I said, put a piece of felt under it, big ball of wax, don't pour there, whatever. There's definitely ways around it. And obviously you can use that under a pad or a plate or use it under an open shoe. And then the, the other uh, support material is metal, like just nailing on a hard bar right onto the frog. If you're not using that in conjunction with dental press material or everything, then it's just the frog. You're not incorporating the commissures or the, the bars, seed of corn, all of that area, which may or may not be what you want to do. And then a pad, um, probably the most conservative way to go is a pad with no support material, just some sort of packing to keep the foot from getting too funky. And leather for me is more forgiving because I've worked on a lot of horses and just don't even have enough foot to rebalance them. So it's nice to let that foot be able to settle into the pad a little bit. And when I first moved to Florida, started using a lot of leather pads, I pulled them off and the pads all compressed at the heels. I'm like, well, I don't like that. So I switched back to using composite plastic. And I pulled the shoe off, look at the pad. Oh, cool, the pad looks great. A few go around to that, I finally figured out the foot's taking the beating, not the pad. So if you're using leather and it's compressing, that's taking some of the abuse, not just the feet. So for me, heels, crappy heels, love leather pads. Especially if you can float it off a little bit, which I'll show you here in just a second. All right, these three. What are the similarities and the differences between these, these three setups? They all are supporting the back half of the foot, obviously. We've talked about the different ground interactions. Um, as far as traction, GFR, the one on the left has the most GFR, the one on the right has the least. Uh, which one's going to bother a horse with synthetic footing the most? Don't know, maybe the middle one. Uh, if you have too much traction on this heel plate, we drill the holes in it just to take some weight out of it and then give that impression material a place to go. Don't drill the holes, that'll make that thing a little bit slicker. Um, so, what are the differences? The shoe on the right is going to move the most. As that horse loads it, he's going to come through the shoe, taking that pad with him far more. Well, the one on the left won't move at all, and the one on the middle will. So, that may or may not be a good thing. You may want that luxury the first time around on a horse that has no foot in the back half. Let that thing move. You're not overloading it too much. Now, the one, what's the differences, similarities? I don't know if you guys have used flip-flops. I don't use a lot of them, but they're really cool when I do. The first time I really kind of fell in love with them, I had a horse with heart bars, and he was doing great, but he did not keep the shoes on. Drove me crazy, so out of frustration, I'm going to put a pair of these on you. And then I came back in five weeks, and holy smokes, the bars and heels just it came alive. So they're great for that. They let the back portion of that foot kind of float and move. You have a prolapsed frog if it's not too severe. This is a great way to start that off. You'll nail these on. Of course, maybe you want some view for a couple of days if he's a little out you. But you nail these on, a lot of times you'll come back in four or five weeks and everything's on the same plane. So you're on your way to rehabbing that foot if that works. Shoe in the middle is just a full equithane pour. We have the holes in the pads to help hold everything in. Sometimes that can be a little bit of a challenge in wet Florida. You have a lot of options, with, especially when you put a pad on there. So if you don't want any support material in the front half of that, you can do one of two things. Dam it off and just pour the, the back half so the toe is open, kind of like 
back to that white trash heart bar, you're just doing it with equipane. The other trick you can do is take your soul pack, whatever you use, put it under the pad in the cranial half so you won't get any impression or any equitane pores sliding through there. Run it in, and now you'll have it clear across the ground if that's what you want to do is support clear to the ground, but you don't have direct pressure on the sole in the front half. So that's another trick. There's just a lot of different ways you can do all that. The shoe on the right, big old white hard bar, so we call them fart bars. And the reason I chose that for this horse is he's sinking a little bit. And back to our papillae, right? If he's sinking, and I put pressure directly under those little papillae, number one, he, he may not like it, probably won't like it. And number two, I don't want to compress those guys. But I wanted a lot of support on this horse. So I brought it out to where it covers the commissure for the frog, and I'll go back in and cut out the dental impression material that's sticking out because I don't want any of that on the sole, and then this shoe happened to be glued on. It was a home run for him. However, some of you will go home and try that. He might instantly hate it, or he might be great for two days and then he's crippled, or two weeks and then he's crippled. Typically what that means is he sunk some more, and what was, in the beginning, support has now turned into pressure, and they hate it. I've just, I've been down that monkey road dance so many times. It's, that's really challenging. Now, if you want to leave your, the seat of the corn area, your bar is open, just make the, the tie-in area where you welded that bar much smaller so you can leave access there to get in and clean it, treat it, that sort of thing. That'll work well on some of these horses. Um, so does that make sense? That kind of help sort through the thought process of where to go with these. Here's a cool trick. The platter-footed thin-soled horses, this has worked really well for me, support the whole foot. But I want the equithane slightly recessed at the toe, so you just cut out the pad. It works much better if you do this before you nail on the shoe. Cut out the pad, your foam board, so it slips right down in there. Start tapering it out to the back wherever you want it, and then pour it in. It works great. That keeps from overloading the thin soles. Okay. This horse, I, I learned a lot from shoeing this guy. I worked on him a lot of years. He, lived in Chicago and his feet would blow up and he'd come back in the winter and we'd redo his feet and he'd go back to the morning. Cool horse, big heart. But look at his confirmation, right? That stinks. So right, right out of the knee, the, the cannon bone comes out of the knee on the lateral aspect. So boom, number one, ding. Number two, there's a little bit of a lateral rotation, valgus formation of that cannon bone coming out. And then if you look down, his hoof capsule, it's a little hard to appreciate here, but his hoof capsule is offset laterally in relation. So if we go up to the radius and drop a plumb line down, his vertical plumb line and his feet are almost in two different zip codes. So this medial aspect of the foot is just set up to take a beat. And this is what we're dealing with now. Um, and this is the medial part. And I'm not a quarter crack genius. I haven't worked on very many, but this little float here, three quarter shoe with no support behind the crack doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense to the foot either because the, the major crack is growing out a little bit and then he blew another one ahead of it. So not quite the way to go in my opinion. Here's our radiograph. I can't really say anything good about this radiograph. We've got a terrible COA balance, long toe. We see two wings in the coffin bone. You guys see that? There's one wing, and there's the other wing. So if you see that, you have one or two things going on. You have a medial lateral imbalance, and therefore you need to take a DP radiograph. Or look at your shoe, or if the horse is barefoot, your x-ray block should have some markers. We want the x-ray beam going right through there, because that's those are the soft tissue parameters that we're going to be looking at. If you're up, if you're above that or below that, now your x-ray beam's going through at an angle, so you get an obliquity looking at your, your coffin bone, which will create that visualization. So you need to figure out do we have a balance problem or a pile of error taking the radiographs. So anyway, if we look at this wing of the coffin bone, we already know his confirmation. Which wing is that? Is that medial or lateral? It's got a sheer heel. I didn't show that picture. Look at it from behind. The medial wall is longer, 
longer. So it's got to be the medial is, is higher and longer, right? That's got to be the lateral that's low. Not my experience, but that sometimes how, how it goes. And then, as Rick Red would say, these heel bulbs are squirting out of the back of there like a baboon's butt, telling you it's overloaded. Obviously. So here's our DP radiograph. Nails lateral marker. So that's a mess, too. What concerns me the most is the lack of soul depth underneath the medial wearing the coffin bone. So what do we have? All the stuff we just talked about. The good thing is, I've got time. I can shoot this horse however I want to keep shoes on. So off we go. There's my shoe. Well within a heel plate, extended it up medially. I do a lot of this to try and help the ground, the ground support, the ground reaction to keep the medial part up since we know it's it's low, or excuse me, we can't restore the medial lateral and balance. We know he's overloading the medial. So I'll do this, and I'll do this in varying degrees. Sometimes I'll run that plate clear up to the second nail, but that's worked really well for me. So anyway, I want to run that up to where my float starts. Side bone this shoe from the toe back through the lateral heel, and I will come back and rasp off those nail heads. I don't want those hanging up when he's tapping his lateral, taking away from the mechanics I'm going to accomplish. I can't stand nails causing the horse's feet to grab. That just it adds torsion to already sore, compromised feet. So for me, that's something to keep in mind. I knew we weren't going to get this foot medial lateral balance, so I gave my leather wedge pad just a little bit of twist, give him a medial lift, and that's my float. Um, so we unloaded that just ahead of the quarter crack. Actually, I already shot it. I didn't need quite that much float. Um, I'll live with it. I'll, re I'll fix that next time I come back. And that's also my quarter patch, quarter crack repair on that foot. That's it. I just did it mechanically. It grows out every year. I know the horse well enough. If he's gonna, if this is a jumping horse and he's going to the ring in three days, you'll have to do something with that. But mechanically, we addressed what he needed to. So here's the shoe that he, when he goes back to run, and then we put on him. This is a wedge triumph. Forge down the lateral branch to make it thinner. Side on it again. Well in the heel plate, he's got an rocker toe to address the COA imbalance. And then on the foot surface, on the medial, from where the plate ends back, I grind that down as thin as I can to get into the plate. It gives us our float to unload the medial aspect of the foot. And this guy can run in this. The trainers say no, but just shut up and run your horse. What? I am, but... Let me put it behind and see if it comes up. Okay, here's another cool one that I learned a lot from. You guys can read all this. Just the feet are sore. They've been sore forever. Lots of injections. The frog is completely worthless. We don't have any heel growth. The cool thing is, this horse has a lot of hoof mass and the walls are thick. So I finally have something to work with. We can get somewhere. And the owner said, fix her feet. I don't care how long it takes. We want to get her sold, but we've got to fix her feet first. So that's our foot. What do you guys see there? How bad is this foot? Bad? Real bad? Negative PA? I can say your, your heel tubules are ending. See, I had work and then it died. The heel tubules are flat. They end way far forward in the foot. All right, so we took the left foot radiograph first. Not too bad. That'll work. This thing popped up on the screen. I turned around and glanced at it and just flew out of my mouth. Holy shit! <laughs> Which is not a good way to start off telling your client your horse's foot has a lot of problems. <laughs> she knows the bill's getting ready to go up and this is going to be a pain. <laughs> so that, I think, is the worst negative PA without a tendon injury, deflexor injury, that I've seen on a front foot. And we have a lot of soul mass, again, so, something to work with. What concerns me the most is this area right here. We have no soul mass underneath the wings of the coffin bone. And this, one, this horse has long wings. Contraindicating what I said previously, there's a little short stubby. I don't have an answer for that. What I do know is I've got to be really careful loading underneath the wings of that coffin bone if I want to keep the horse happy and make some improvements in the foot. So what are we going to do? We need to restore the balance around the center of articulation. I'm going to give a little bit of a wedge just because. Um, I want omnidirectional breakover, so it's easy for this mare 
to move wherever she wants. We know she's sore in the circles. Let's, let's take that medial lateral break over, omnidirectional break over, and make it easier for her to do that. And I want to float these heels, especially this on fire medial heel. And this was the case in both front feet. The right just happened to be worse. And so now I know the whole back part of the foot is sore. I can't really support that. So I want something really mild. And I chose a piece of felt, soaked it in copper sulfate and vinegar, sprinkled it with copper sulfate, glued that to my clog, and then, I don't know if you see this. Here's my float. This heel is completely floated. So, why did I choose a clog? Well, if you go over the list of things that I wanted to accomplish, and I needed a lot of, a lot of depth, thickness to be able to do all of that, for me, the clog made the most sense. I know it's not a laminitis horse, but it worked great on this horse. So there's our negative 10. Here's how I trimmed the foot. So instead of trimming it one plane from the heel to toe, I tried to utilize our sole mass and trim from where the line, where the line goes to the toe. And what that's going to do is when you trim in that plane, you set your shoe on there, you automatically have a heel float in that that crushed area. This horse, if you just did that alone and don't have a float in your shoe, that foot is so soft and wiggly in the back part, it's going to compress right down. So that's why I want the claw out more float than that. And she'll contact that felt a little bit and hopefully be okay. And she did great with that, except she kept pulling them off. Two days later, she's really happy. So I went to plan B, and that is a heel plate. Made it cute, cut weight out of it. Apparently bored that day and had some time. Um, and went to a leather wedge pad, and here, I don't know if you can see that. What I like to do is taper the heels back on the pad, because as I said, this foot's probably going to come down and settle to it. So if I have that taper on there, the very common part of the heel is going to descend the most, and where the float is, is going to descend the least. So this makes kind of what I hope to be a nice uniform loading as the heel comes down versus the heel just coming down and banging on the shoe. This works really well for me on a lot of horses, not just this one, but I do this a lot. And I still want the rocker toe and mechanics, so, and I still want to try and use my trim and float it. So I ended up with a triple plane in this foot, a double plane on the shoe. So I had a rocker toe, I had a trim back to probably the caudal three quarters of the foot and then the heels unloaded. So does that make sense? It's a little tricky to do the first time, but it's kind of cool. The other way, we have to do a full belly, you still have to load the heels. Anyway, that worked for me. Now it's a hundred horse, so the owner's saying, can we get something lighter? So we went to this setup. She said, she did great in the past, and I could think, like, ah, I don't want to do that. We'll just try it. So I tried it. Three days later, I was back and pulled off because she's crept it. But I thought, dang it, I want to make this work. i got to figure this out. So this was the first time I did the little felt trick. Glued it to the foot, poured over it, pour is recessed at the cranial portion of the foot, a little closer to the ground in the back, and she loved it. The cool thing about this is you feel around on your equithane, it feels like equithane, and you go over that spot where the felt is, it's really soft and it compresses. So it gives them a lot of relief in that area. She stayed sound, went back in training, got vetted, and was sold. So it's somebody else's problem. Left foot at the beginning, this is the end of the shoeing cycle, the first day, and I know I look back, I should have taken more toe off of that foot, um, but that's all right. And the slide on the right is not after we were done, but after I've been working on it for nine months, that is at the end of the shoeing cycle. Why didn't I show one right after I trimmed and shot the horse? Because so many feet look great when we're done. That's not where the rubber hits the road, in my opinion. These feet go south in the, in the back half of the shoeing cycle. So let's find out, are the changes we make to this foot, are they helping when we're finished growing at the end of the cycle? Because so many feet, you can make them look better, and then you come back, and they're right back where they were. So we're really not doing any justice. This is, I'm my own worst critic. I, I criticize my radiographs far more at the end of the shooting cycle than at the beginning. And I, I use caution on using before and after photographs the same day, because. Again, most people can clean up the foot and make it look nice. So I apologize for that. I didn't do it. I took piles of radiographs. I didn't do a very good job of taking pictures on this. But the, 
image on the left is when we first started, and the image on the right is after shooting, uh, basically a year later. This mare was, I think at this point, was we had a buyer and she was leaving. The two things I like the most are the dorsal wall angle, which normally I don't give a crap what that is. I don't ever use a hoof gauge. If I offend you guys that do, I'm, I'm sorry, but for me, it, it doesn't mean anything. Um, if I want to know, I'll use a tech rating guy. But what I really like is the, the change in conformation at the heel bulbs. The heels are standing up. We've got some height, some vertical depth to it, and that also goes along with our improvement of the sole depth. Look underneath the wings of the coffin boat on this image. But now we have some sole mass. That probably made that mare as comfortable as anything. That probably helped her, I don't know as much, but that, that probably helped almost as much as increasing the PA back to where it ought to be. From a foot perspective, the coffin joints and the vehicle structures are obviously going to really like the improved PA. Okay. Um, so, in a rehash, in case you haven't been paying attention, don't overload it if it's sore. Repeat, repeat after me. What? Oh, I cast it on. Sorry. The other cool way to do it is make up some aluminum tabs. I'm stealing this from uh, Patrick Brodus. So make up some aluminum hand tabs, screw them into the claw, lay them on the wall, and glue them on, or you can tape it on with elastic on. I do that on a lot of my acute laminitis horses. That works really well. Um, so determine how you want everything to interact with the ground. And be conscientious of your moisture, because you can have the right package, but if your moisture is killing your frog, you're kind of losing the battle when you don't have to be. And again, monitor the frog. Don't forget about your internal structures. And like I said earlier, you may have a rapid increase in growth. Here's the classic, classic sign of this. This horse has no foot. Came to me, this is the first time I looked at it. So we did our thing, and it was not the end of the first shooting cycle, but the second. <laughs> That's what we have. So now we've created another problem. Obviously, this horse's shooting cycle needs to be dramatically shortened. But I'll take the foot on the right any day. I can do whatever I want with that. The one on the left, you nail something up and pucker up and hope it works. So that's an example of what might happen. And then owners, it's kind of hard to explain sometimes. I'm like, you just did my horse and she already looks long. Oh, that's good, she's growing. Or they show out another 300 bucks, they don't think it's that funny. Nine o'clock, we're done. I miss calling